Hey guys, we're actually going to talk about raising tadpoles. So whether you're raising tadpoles for, for your kids that you found in a puddle, uh, in a wetland, or you're breeding things like these Amazonian milk frogs, which is literally South America's version of a gray tree frog. I'm up in the Northeast. We have lots of gray tree frogs. This is a lot like a gray tree frog, just a little bit bluer. A killer species of frog. It's so wonderful to take care of. They're so enjoyable. They're so tractable. Very um, easy to accomplish their basic husbandry and they're incredibly hardy. Some frogs you can just set them up properly and they'll as they really they're immature and they condition themselves they'll actually opt out to actually start breeding. A lot of these frogs will actually respond to rain showers and in some cases let's say if I'm breeding red-eyed tree frogs I actually take them out of their normal cage so I condition them so your female is very fat, she's laden with a lot of eggs and I put her into her cage where there may be multiple males. Multiple males will actually cause competition and what I do is I put them in a rain chamber. So I have a nice conditioned female full of eggs, introduce her into an environment where there's maybe a couple males and I start raining. So I have a pump and it goes all the way up to a top and it goes to a spray bar and then the water all comes down. The sound, the movement of the water and the increased humidity a lot of times will actually trigger these guys to actually start breeding. So even if you're doing Colorado River toads, you would actually go through a period of brumation where they're gonna go quiet. And at that point, they might stay like that for months underground. And then uh, to wake them from that, you start increasing their light cycles, start providing UVB, and uh, start raining on them. Put them in a rain chamber and hopefully that initiates them. So. They've bred, you've got eggs, now what do you do? This is where things get tricky. So once you have eggs from these guys, so what kind of water do you use? This is, this is a misnomer. A lot of times people think, well, if I use reverse osmosis water or I use distilled water, that is therefore the best water because it's free of pollutants. There's a big problem with that. Problem is, distilled water and reverse osmosis water has no minerals in that. So the delicate nature of a frog like this, this little guy is literally filled with minerals and all sorts of things. So every time he goes into a bin of reverse osmosis water, what it actually does is the water actually starts leaching some of the minerals even from a living organism like a frog. Certainly happens to fish. So if I take a fish, let's say like a beta, and I put it in reverse osmosis water or distilled water, it will pull all the minerals out. So it's hungry water and that can burn the fish. It will kill the fish. I certainly think it's gonna do the same thing to frogs, certainly to tadpoles. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna look for, if you do reverse osmosis water, use that water, but you're gonna use something that replenishes the minerals in the water. If we talk about water parameters, I think a pH of about 6.5 is excellent. Something like that, safe. Uh, we're gonna talk about hardness. Hardness are like two to four, two to six. Uh, KH, so KH is the measurement of resistance to acid. So if the frog is in the water or you have a bunch of tadpoles in there or fish, what they're doing is they're releasing all sorts of acids. The whole uh, bacterial process releases a lot of acids and what it does is cause your pH to start sinking. So it's acids in the water which will cause your pH to start getting wacky. With fish, you don't want your pH adjusting more than three tenths of one unit per day. So with these guys, I'm going to pretty much think my fish sense is going to be applicable to frogs. So you have UVB light and you have a basking lamp. So that's going to put out some heat. So if you put your finger there, you can feel some heat. And believe it or not, frogs like to bask. And this is where your tadpoles end up down here? So they lay their eggs. You just keep the water really clean. And uh, the quality of the water. So there would be no chlorinated water in there. Uh, what I strongly recommend is things like spring water and stuff like that. And all spring water is not created equal, but just like a reasonable bottled water that you can drink is a really good idea as opposed to chlorinated water or something with uh, some kind of pollutants in it. So if your water is questionable, go get some drinking water. But these guys do great in there. All right, good thing you can touch on that. Okay. Okay, so the next thing is you have your eggs, so you, um, whatever your vessel is that actually contains the eggs, you want to take that vessel and you want to transfer it to a simple bin, something like this. Uh, one thing that's very, very critical, guys, no tap water. Chlorinated water is really scary. And if you are using chlorinated water, at least 24 to 48 hours, you need to let that sit or even put an air stone on that. And what that's going to do, it's going to dissipate the chlorine as a gas. 
very critical. Chlorine kills things and it's going to kill your tadpoles and your eggs. And it'll also burn the heck out of these tadpoles. And then we're going to fill up a little test tube with a, a water master test kit. Uh, today we want to check um, for the pH, which is just um, a measure of how much minerals are in the water. Uh, make sure, again, it's not too acidic or too alkaline. We're running between 6.6 six and 6.8, uh, which is probably a good range for um, these animals. So now we're going to talk about general hardness and we're going to talk about cage. These are a little bit different and I want to see what we're finding there. Chris is the master of this. We're using right now, we're using Aquarium Pharmaceuticals for the uh, brand of the test. So he starts with blue and now he's seeing how many drops it takes until it changes. So that started to change right there after the second one. It's not fully yellow yet, but it's gonna be close to between two and three drops. That should take it right over. So now we're in that yellow yeah. range. Yeah, maybe one more drop. So it's probably three drops. And it's a little bit uh, low on the KH, but these guys are doing well. So remember guys, KH is the resistance to acids in the system, and the acids will cause the pH to degrade. And uh, we really want to kind of keep our pH stable. So dissolved uh, minerals in the water, which is essentially the measurement of that KH, uh, is critical. If the KH was like zero, the pH can do a lot of uh, adjusting. One other thing, when you have plants in your system and you have tadpoles, when you don't have light at night, the plants are actually taking the oxygen from the water column. So they're actually eating or consuming the oxygen. So uh, you want to make sure you realize that. And if my KH was low, as you start getting more CO2 in the water system, your pH starts degrading. It's really hard to give you guys a quick, concise thing, but some of these points are really critical. So we're gonna do the general hardness. Okay. So if we do not have this in the water, horrible things happen and you'll burn the animals. It will, just, it will suck out all of the minerals, their slime coat, everything that makes this a living organism. So if you put this little tadpole and distilled water or reverse osmosis water, it's going to pull all the salts, all the different things out of that, and it's going to kill that organism. Four. That's good. I yeah. like a hardness. Four to six. Yeah, we definitely don't want to be in like that three range. It's where we usually want to make some changes. Yeah, it's starting to change. There we go. So, if you do, let's say if you are using distilled water, reverse osmosis water, you need to manage your, your water previous to the introduction of any of these, maybe a couple hours. You can use something like replenish. So if I have reverse osmosis water, which is water that is actually forced through a membrane and it leaves behind dissolved organics, minerals, and then it basically strips the water of minerals. We want to put back the right minerals, so you use a product like this. And then with what Chris is doing, we uh, follow directions, look at your target uh, KH, target GH, and uh, you want to monkey around with this stuff. This is what fish keeping is all about. This is what we do. Using your test kit that Chris is showing is critical. He's always having to monitor the water parameters for the success of our multiple different fish systems and all the different kind of fish we keep. Okay, now let's say you've, we've take, taken a look at our water. Chris is actually showing you some of the parameters. Really, really good advice, guys. This is the difference between success and failure. Next thing I do, I take a shallow, a shallow bin of water and I use an air pump. And I use these little sponge filter type things right here. You want a large footprint with a lot of surface area and shallow. Shallow is gonna help you succeed. Because what happens is the tadpoles will sit on the bottom and then they'll swim to the top and they'll get a gulp of air. And they're basically, at this point, they're going from using their gills to actually breathing directly from the atmosphere. Little baby tadpoles a lot of times cannot, or they're struggling to break beyond the surface tension of the water. And they've actually, they've actually taken, uh, they've studied this and they actually do like this little double gulp. It's pretty interesting. Wait, so you're saying the tadpoles can't get above the water because there's something on the floor? A little, yes, a little baby tadpole sometimes, uh, the, so the surface tension, they're coming up here and they're actually hitting this. 
So what they do is they come up and then they immediately expand their mouth and you do this little double gasp and then they grab the air and it helps them get rid of the, the old air uh, that they're breathing out. And it's really interesting because, uh, so the surface tension, so if I make a long distance and then they're going all the way up here to do this every single time, you're actually gonna have a high mortality on these guys. So that is about three days old, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's a three day old tadpole. That little guy is, uh, life is really tough for him. So I wanna have shallow water. Then what I do, I take a little bubbler like this. And another thing I might note, this is a little sponge filter and it's got this material on the bottom and that actually colonizes with bacteria. This bacteria is what breaks down all the different wastes of decaying food, uh, the waste of the tadpole and breaks it down to less noxious compounds. Uh, so in fish, we like to have these filters that are already running or already set up and they do really well and they basically uh, allow things to, uh, to achieve a biological balance. Now, I won't really go into that because this is really fish keeping. The trick with these guys is keep your water shallow. Frequent water changes is really a good idea. Uh, and uh, adding oxygen to the water, something like that is great. So then I incorporate uh, plants. Always plants and uh, snails. Plants and snails are really great. Uh, the plants give a uh, further feeding opportunity, plus there's a lot of bacteria on them, and that's actually good bacteria. The snails are going to help go around and eat up the decaying waste as the tadpoles have missed. Smaller incremental feeding is also key. Uh, and why I like to do that is like get them so they, they pretty much eat everything I've offered within five minutes. And uh, you don't want to have a lot of decaying material because when you have the decaying material, your ammonia spikes and ammonia is very uh, toxic to these guys. I'll show you a couple of foods that I use. Largely, uh, these tadpoles are going to eat a lot of vegetable-based protein. So spirulina is excellent. Algae is excellent. Uh, where they're naturally existing, there's all sorts of biofilm, which is all microorganisms, plus all sorts of dissolved organics and living plant matter. Here you have a spirulina tab. So there's so much good, you know, commercial grade fish foods that you can get in any pet store. You just want to give them something good. And another thing I like to do, I give them vegetable based protein, but I also give them a little bit of animal based protein. And the animal based protein seems to uh, get really good strong growth out of these and they love to eat. So mixing it up a little bit is probably a good idea, but a good staple is vegetable based flakes. Okay. So this guy is like nibbling on that wafer. You see that? Yep. Okay. So that's really good. I just disturbed these guys. All right, see that? So this is going straight up to the atmosphere just like that one did. Now, you yeah, got that? Yep. Okay, so this is critical. So I want to keep that distance shallow. If I go too deep, like we're thinking, oh, I'll put them in a 10 gallon tank, you're actually creating more environmental challenges for that tadpole. So shallow bin, bins of water with a little filter, a little sponge filter, and then I like to include wood. And uh, I'm not sure if I'm actually accurate on this, but I believe uh, the wood, a nice piece of seasoned wood, they can rasp some of the cellulose because when we deal with placostomus, which are fish and stuff like that, they'll do that. So for, as a precaution, depending on what species, I'm going to include the little bit of wood in there, seasoned wood. So you want wood that has been underwater for quite some time. There's a lot of microbes on it and it's really good. And it's also covered in bacteria and that's good bacteria. So you can see all different stages of growth. So this is about three days. Let's go a little bit into five or six days. They should look nice and fat, nice and fat. So they, they uh, eat a lot and they grow quite rapidly. And uh, see if you see this right here, this is beautiful. So like, so I see the wood, I see the, plants, I see the low, you don't have a really a lot of water in there because they can't break yeah, the Yeah, and this would right? usually go in there, yeah, because I'm keeping these all in a different area, but I just, you know, you have the little air pumps. There's no air pump in this one though, is that okay? For right now it is, yeah. but that's only, there's an air pump in every single one of these okay. because you really want to make sure your water, besides changing new and frequent water changes, and it's a partial water change. So you're taking out some of it, replacing it with newer aged water. Uh, hopefully what Chris was going over with the water parameters, really simple. You can buy the test kits in a pet store, but it really makes a lot of sense. I've seen people make mistakes. 
And I actually have a really cool, like a hypo or an albino gene we're actually trying to pull out of these guys. And I had a good group of these guys and I made a dumb mistake. I actually put them all in the same system of water and they all died. And so I don't really know why, but I can tell you being a fish keeper, sometimes when you keep a lot of fish, they'll, the fish, I don't know if it's a stress thing or whatever, but when there's a lot of them, they can release something like a chemical. It's trying to, you know, spread them out. And because it's a, you know, in, enclosed area, that chemical probably can build up and it caused mortality. It was incredibly high and it was like just sudden and overnight. When I was doing pixie frogs, there was a lot of uh, predation of the bigger ones on the smaller ones. Pixie frogs are like a monstrous tadpole. So I did better like pulling out like the large ones, putting them into, you know, size groups. And before long, you have all these different systems of water. Uh, same thing's applicable here. Not all tadpoles grow at the same rate. When you're doing uh, salamanders, axolotls, uh, rib newts, any of that stuff, you'll start getting out of a brood. You'll get ones that are very successful. They grow really fast. They're, they eat a lot. And those in numbers can actually uh, further cause the mid-level ones and the really meek ones to struggle. And it's sometimes a really good idea to actually take out the meek ones and maybe the mid middle ones and put them in their own system. And then that way you can start graduating the success of these animals. Frequent bins is really good. It's really safe because in case one area things go wrong, you have a backup. I screwed up, took all my different areas. I combined them all. I made a huge mistake. So that's really good. Okay. Temperature parameters, uh, really, really key on these guys. Temperature parameters on your tadpoles. So since you're adults, you're typically living between 78 to low 80s. Uh, replicating that with the tadpoles is really wise, in my opinion. So I like temperatures right about 78, 80 degrees. What happens is as water starts getting warmer, it holds less saturated oxygen. So the content of oxygen available to a gilled animal is less. That's why things like axolotls and whatever and trout have huge oxygen demands. They need their water cold. Cold water holds a lot of oxygen. Warm water does not. Uh, same thing applicable with these guys. 78, 80 degrees seems like a really good target. Uh, 82 is probably okay too, but I am always uh, agitating the water, adding an air bubbler in there with a little filter. Maybe T positive. So, wait, so in nature, I noticed that the tadpoles are always close to the shore. You know, they're, they're where you can get to them quite easily. So I'm assuming is that because oxygen gets to that point of the water easier, or what? That's a Did that's a really surface? good point. Okay. So Donnie just that's an excellent point. Why are the tadpoles in nature in the shallower water? Because they they want to go to the atmosphere. They want where there's a lot of oxygen. Also, there's less predators there. Uh, but a lot of, there's a lot of wading birds that actually will predate them. But shallow water once again they can go right to the atmosphere they can pull oxygen so tadpoles have this uh incredible ability to live in very stagnant areas where the oxygen content of the water is very very low so that nature has allowed them to start directly pulling their oxygen from the atmosphere and then we get to a really critical time which is where the animal goes from a tadpole gets its back legs then it gets its front legs and then very quickly the animal will suck up the tail, so it pulls all the you know, nutrition of the tail, and then it becomes a little froglet. At one point, they go from being an aquatic, fully aquatic, where they can go to the surface and get their air, to suddenly they need to come out of that. And that is where mortality occurs. So you must aid the transition. You must be very sensitive to that transition. It can happen really fast, catch you off guard, and you might notice you have a whole bunch of froglets that failed to get them out, and they panicked and uh, they drown. All right, this is a little, uh, look at that, he opened his mouth. This is a little baby Amazonian milk frog and he's so cute, how can you not love this? All right, we have to be really careful from the transition from a tadpole to a little froglet. This is a very precarious time. We wanna make sure we uh, give lots of options and opportunities for the animal to get out of the water and not fall back into the water where it can drown. At this point, I could actually get it from an aquatic environment into just a damp environment. Make sure we don't have things dank. We certainly want air circulation. You don't want to get a lot of bacteria and fungus and mold. Uh, these guys are now little miniature frogs. At this point, they're going to start eating. We can give them uh, fruit flies. So there's wingless Drysophila. You could also give it a little pithead crickets. 
and uh, just little things, spring tails and whatnot. See his tail, Donnie? Yes. That tail will be gone in about a day. It's going to suck that up into its body? Yep. It's going to just. It's going to be just like one of these little guys. Kevin's been bothering everyone with his frogs lately. They've been all trying to do work, and he's like, look at my tadpoles. When he goes in that water, panic, panic. So remember, not all frogs are going to be the great little climbers. And it's time to get this guy out of there entirely. So why am I not wearing gloves? Well, I'm not a smoker, and I don't have any chemicals in me other than obviously the chemicals in my diet. So, but remember, if you are maybe a vapor and you have a lot of chemicals or medication and whatever in your diet or in your life, uh, all that stuff is gonna come out through your pores and it can be very toxic to these guys. Certainly if you're a nicotine lover or anything like that, that, that alkaloid could be very uh, toxic to these guys. At that point, get a lid on it. He's safe, he's not ready to go to a terrestrial uh, environment. At that point, you really wanna be careful about any kind of water that this guy can fall into uh, and panic. They drown so quick. Even though they're frogs, uh, they're very uh, vulnerable to drowning. At any age, like when you get... It's, you know, adult frogs can stick and everything like that, but if there's something, uh, very quickly they can pass. Once they uh, breathe in a lot of water, they can drown. Uh, so it's always, you always want to think worst case scenarios, that they can always have something to easily uh, grab onto and pull themselves out. What it would look like. Oh, there's something different there. So do you know these are gonna grow up to look like, like let's say? No, this okay. is just part of our project. Uh, we'll see once it becomes a little froglet. So um, I'm pretty much about, maybe about a week away to seeing what that little guy is gonna look as maybe a T-positive albino. That's, it's, it's pretty exciting. And we have to keep things interesting uh, keeping a lot of these animals, you know, I'm surrounded by so many wonderful animals, but there's a huge amount of labor and attention to detail, and uh, it can be very, very weighing. So sometimes you need to lose yourself in this. One of the reasons why I keep animals is uh, I have a lot of my own mental problems. So I lose myself in the care of these animals and the welfare of these animals, and uh, it helps me stop thinking about what maybe I'm dealing with in my mind and I start worrying about these animals and that's actually transgressed into my entire life the the welfare and uh, appreciation of these animals and understanding of them thank you for liking and subscribing thank you for being part of our audience thank you for participating in the comments please spread the word we're here to represent the hobby I am nothing but an extraordinarily out of control hobbyist and please follow us on our twitch stream on Friday nights we uh pre-show what's going to drop the next day. Please follow Evil Morph God on Instagram as well as New England Reptile on Instagram. And Donnie's going to tell you to follow Donnie Rapture. Rapture. Oh my God. Donnie's going to tell you to follow Donnie Rapture on Instagram. But uh, we really do appreciate all of you following us and being part of our audience. Thank you. I turn my camera on, dude. You didn't turn your camera on!